So yeah, my name is uh, Joost Vosblom. I'm part of uh, Forza Hydrogen Electric Racing. It, we are uh, a dream team of the TU Delft. So we built this beautiful pink race car. <laughs> and okay, sure, great, pink race car. What's so special about it? Well, besides the part, the part that it's pink, of course. Well, that's that it runs on hydrogen. If you look closely on this picture right there, you can see something that looks like steam coming out. Well, that's actually a water vapor. So this car runs on hydrogen and the only pollutant it produces is pure water. So actually it's not polluting at all. So why do we do this? Why do we build this car? Well, of course, because it's fun, but also because we have a vision. And as uh, Anna already mentioned, we believe that hydrogen is going to be a big part of the future. Um, we're already talking about surviving. Well, our planet also needs to survive. And right now we're polluting it a lot and uh, the climate is changing. So we need to transition to clean energy, to green energy. And we believe that hydrogen will play a big role in that. And then we translated that to a mission and we made our mission to promote this hydrogen. And we figured that making a pink race car is one of the best ways to do that. But we haven't always had this super big race car. Actually, we also had this, this evolution that we've been talking about. We started off with these small little carts, then we scaled up, then we scaled up again to the first full-size hydrogen electric race car in the world, the Forza 6. But unfortunately, this one was not able to race yet because it wasn't certified. So what we did, we bought a monocoque, so that's the chassis, which needs to be certified. And we built a car around it, which was the Forza 7. And this car was actually the first hydrogen-powered car ever to compete in an official race. And I think that's already a pretty big achievement for some, uh, for some students. So then, the year after, we uh, upgraded the tanks, we made the car quite a bit faster and uh, quite a bit pinker as well. And we were finally able to actually finish the race as well because the previous car didn't, <laughs> didn't have enough hydrogen on board to finish the race. So this car is built by students. So this is the team and uh, we consist currently of 18 full-timers and uh, roughly 30 part-timers. And these are all students that voluntarily work on this project without any financial compensation, not even study credits, just because we really believe in hydrogen and we really want to show the world what it's capable of. So then I started to think, well, what, what does that actually mean? How can hydrogen help us? Well, let's first take a look at how this car actually works. So, I think the, the race car part speaks for itself. I mean, it accelerates up to 100 kilometers an hour in under four seconds, has a top speed of 210, and uh, the torque on the back wheels is uh, 100 and, sorry, 1800 Newton meters, which to the, the car enthusiasts uh, under us, they know it's quite a lot. Um, but what's actually a lot more interesting is the hydrogen electric part. So if you take a look at the car under the hood, you can see a lot of complex systems. You can see, of course, the electric motors in the back. You can see the hydrogen tank, the yellow tank, but there's a lot of other systems. Then if we take a look from the top, you can, you can see the tank, you can see the motors, but actually there's a lot of other stuff in there. For instance, in here, there's a buffer of supercapacitors, which of course you can't see now but they can store some extra energy which we can generate by braking and then use again to accelerate. And there's also a lot of cooling systems right here, right here. There's radiators, there's compressors, and of course a lot of electronics to get everything to work properly. There's over 200 sensors in the car. And if you then take an even closer look, you can see it, it gets really, really complex. So if we simplify that a little bit, we can see that there's actually four main components. So there's the hydrogen tank, which we store our energy, we store the hydrogen. And then we have this fuel cell, which is sort of the heart of the entire machine. That's where the hydrogen is combined with oxygen to produce electricity, 
which then you goes either into our accumulator, the buffer, or directly to the motors. And when we break, we can actually reuse the energy because we can transform the kinetic energy back into electrical energy and store that into our accumulator again, which we can later use to drive, of course, more efficiently and also have more power to accelerate. Let's take a closer look at this fuel cell. So how does it actually work? Well, these fuel cells are also called stacks because they're stacks of membranes. And they're also called PEM fuel cells, proton exchange membranes. And in the, these membranes, uh, hydrogen is split into its proton and its electron. The protons can be exchanged through the membrane, they can pass through, but the electrons they can't, so they go around and then of course that creates a current and that's what we use to drive the car. And you can see on the one hand the hydrogen comes in, other side the oxygen comes in and all that comes out is just pure H2O. It's actually cleaner than the water you get from your tap because it's so pure that it's actually unhealthy to drink. So this, this process is really nice in the car and it's really clean in the car but as long as the hydrogen that you're producing is not clean then of course the technology itself is also not clean. So where, where do we get this hydrogen? Well there are many ways, I mean hydrogen is the most abundant uh, atom in the world and in the universe but we need to get it somewhere. Well, one of the easiest ways to get it now, or the largest scale, is by steam gas reforming. And that's when we take natural gas, we put it together it's, uh, with steam at very high temperatures, and then the uh, water vapor reacts with the natural gas to create hydrogen and CO2. But there you have it, CO2. Of course, you can capture that, but still, this is not the most renewable way to produce hydrogen. So therefore we need some really green ways. Maybe, I mean, we can, we can take it from biomass, but the most uh, useful way that it seems now is uh, most likely electrolysis. I think we've all done this in chemistry class. We've put two electrodes into a cup of water and then hydrogen, or sorry, water splits into hydrogen and oxygen. Well, if you do this on a, a far larger scale with also these membranes, you can do it a lot more efficiently. And that's actually one of the best ways to produce hydrogen through electrolysis. So you can use green renewable energy, produce hydrogen, and then you can use that hydrogen later in your car or somewhere else. So that's something like this. So here you can see the renewable energies. We uh, use electrolysis, we make oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen, we can either store it if we have a use for it, or we can just simply let it go into the atmosphere. Hydrogen we can store, we can transport, and then we can actually fuel it into our cars and use it to, again, make power to drive the car. So how does this nice cycle, how does it work, and how can it yeah, help us in the future? Well, for that I went to uh, Professor Ad van Wyk. He's a professor at the TU Delft, and he's an expert in the field of hydrogen and the field of energy. And uh, he actually told me a lot about how hydrogen could help us power the world. So the first misconception I had is that I thought there's not enough green energy to go around. Well, actually, that's not true. If we look at the global energy consumption, we can see that it's 155,000 terawatt hours per year, which is, of course, a huge amount of energy. And that's everything from electricity, but also uh, fossil fuels, everything put together. But then if we take a look at how much it would actually take to generate that energy, we see that we only need 10% of Australia covered with solar panels, or only 1.5% of the Pacific Ocean with uh, offshore wind farms. And then all of a sudden, it actually seems like a pretty small number, this uh, 155 terawatt hours. So what, what is the problem then? Well, the problem is that this energy is not in the right places. So if we take a, a look at the map of the solar irradiance, we can see that most of the solar energy is actually concentrated around the tropics. 
So you can see here, of course, we have the Sahara and here we have uh, Australia. And these are the places where the most energy comes in. But these are also the places that are most inhabitable. I don't think a lot of us actually live in the middle of the desert. So we need a way to get this energy from these places where there's a lot of energy to the places that are more densely populated. The same goes for wind energy. If we take a look, we can see that most of the wind is actually concentrated far offshore because there it's unobstructed and it can blow freely. So if you want to build the most efficient wind farm, you should build it as far offshore as you possibly can. But then again, you run into a problem of transporting that energy from far offshore to your, uh, your house. So again, the problem is transporting energy. Uh, then we take a look at how much energy is there, or sorry, what's the price of this energy? <coughs> now we see that actually the price of renewable energies is rapidly decreasing. If we look at onshore wind, uh, solar power, we can see that there's definitely a decreasing line. And we can see, I'm not sure if you guys are able to see it, but here we have the domain of uh, fossil fuel prices. And we can see that's actually already competitive with fossil fuels and it's actually getting a lot cheaper as time progresses. So therefore we see that we're definitely going to these renewable energies. Uh, again, the records, right now uh, what you're getting from your, uh, your plug is roughly 20 cents per, kilowatt, per kilowatt hour and we can already produce it for three dollar cents per kilowatt hour. So very, very cheap. Um, but not all of our energy is electric that we're using now. Right now we're only using 16% of our energy as electricity. Most of it is still through liquid fuels, so we're actually still very fossil addicted. So most of our energy is still through fossil means. And if we want to increase the infrastructure of electricity to have all of our to match all of our energy needs, we need to increase it by a six or a seven fold, which is a lot. And actually, increasing our electro, uh, electricity grid is very expensive. If we take a look at how much uh, it costs to uh, yeah make a cable or make a pipeline to transport the same amount of energy we can see that the pipeline is actually 15 times cheaper for the same amount of energy. Or it's 15 times more expensive to transport electricity than it is to transport energy through hydrogen. And of course then the further away you move from your energy, energy source, the more, uh, how do you say, the more profitable it becomes to use hydrogen. So then we come to the point of efficiency. What is efficiency? What does it really mean? Well, of course we have energy efficiency. And then hydrogen is not that efficient. I mean, in the process of electrolysis, we already lose roughly half of our energy. And then we need to transport it, we need to compress it, we need to fuel it. And then in the fuel cell, we again lose roughly 50% of our energy. So in the end, we only have 25% of our energy left. So it doesn't really seem like a good solution. But actually, is it really energy efficiency that we care about or is it cost efficiency? And then we have to take a look, I think, in a sustainable future where all of our energy is generated in a renewable way. Actually, the cost efficiency becomes way more important because there, under the line, is no polluting anyway. So you might as well get your energy the cheapest way possible. And that's where hydrogen can play a really big role, especially if you look at the infrastructure. Then one of the questions I always get is this, this hydrogen car, isn't that a driving bomb? People always, yeah, they relate it to, for instance, the Hinterberg, uh, what's it called, the, the blimp. Of course, people relate it to hydrogen bomb, which is something completely different, but still it has the word hydrogen in it, so it must be the same thing. Uh, so then 
let's take a look. Is it actually unsafe to use hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is flammable, but so is gasoline, so is diesel. That's the point of it. It has a lot of energy. But with energy, of course, comes risk. But it's not explosive. It only becomes explosive if it's mixed with oxygen. But in our tanks, we have 100% hydrogen, so in the tanks, it will never combust. Then the systems, the tanks, everything else is, of course, rigorously tested and also certified. So again, there we mitigate a lot of risk. And then a very interesting one is hydrogen is very light. It's the lightest element there is. It's a gas, so it escapes. So if there is a leak, hydrogen will float up into the atmosphere, sometimes at 20 meters per second. So it's all often already gone from its source before it can even ignite. And if we take a look at these pictures, you can actually see that really clearly. Because here we have a hydrogen car, and here we have a gasoline-powered car. And after three seconds, so at both of them, they made a leak or they, they opened a valve and they put a spark there to ignite it. We can see that in the hydrogen car, there's a very large flame, but it's going straight up away from the vehicle. While in the gasoline car, the gasoline is dropping down and it's forming a puddle underneath the car. Then after 16 seconds, the hydrogen flame is already starting to decrease in size while actually the gasoline car is almost burnt out. And then in 90 seconds, the hydrogen car has uh, basically yeah, stopped burning while I wouldn't want to be inside of this gasoline powered car. And they put temperature sensors everywhere and here on the back seat of the hydrogen car, the temperature only increased by 15 degrees, which is, I mean, it's something, but it's not a lot considering how yeah, how much hotter it gets in the, in the gasoline-powered car. So why are we not driving hydrogen? Why probably nobody in the audience here is driving a hydrogen car? Well, that's mostly due to infrastructure. Right now, there's only two refueling stations in the Netherlands that are public. There's a few other ones, but it's not really feasible to drive hydrogen just yet. But there are a lot of opportunities to actually build this infrastructure very quickly. Because in the Netherlands we have one of the yeah, tightest natural gas networks in the world. So we could reuse a lot of these networks to transport hydrogen. Uh, furthermore, we can uh, have large-scale hydrogen production in these areas with a lot of sustainable energy. For instance, far offshore in the North Sea, but also in the Sahara. And then we could use all of these oil pipelines that are already there to transport it back to Europe. And what's also very, very important in uh, renewable energies, which I haven't talked about yet, is the storage of energy. Because as we all know, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But we are always using energy. So we need a way to store energy and lots of energy. And if you look at the types of energy there are, there's kinetic, there's potential, but most of these aren't really feasible in the Netherlands. I mean, you can have uh, dams and large lakes, pump water up, store energy that way, but we have no elevation here. It's completely flat, so that's not really the way to do it. You could use uh, kinetic energy, you could use uh, a large fl flywheel to store energy. This is actually done in some places, but only for the short term. And in the Netherlands, we need seasonal storage. Because in the summer, we have a lot of generation of energy. And in the winter, we have a lot of consumption of energy. So we need something to bridge that. Well, then you think maybe batteries. But you would need thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions of uh, Tesla power walls to actually store that amount of energy. So again, that's not feasible. So then the only real feasible way to store energy that's left is in a molecule, uh, ke ke chemical energy. And that's where hydrogen comes in. You can produce hydrogen on a very large scale and then store it in underground caverns, for instance, salt caverns, but also in empty gas fields. And that way you can store energy for a long time 
and also a large amount of energy. So actually that's where hydrogen also is going to play a pretty important role. So let's take a look at how that might look in the future. So I took this data from a report, the Infrastructure Outlook by uh, uh, Gas Unie and Tenet, so the gas company and the electricity company. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty well balanced in its, uh, uh, in its research. So uh, what's the energy demand going to look like in 2050? Well, most of it is probably going to be electric. If you take a look at these graphs, there's three different scenarios, the local, the national, and the international. The local one is mostly decentralized energy. So basically, we put a solar panel on our roof, we have a battery to store the electricity, and we generate our own gen energy. And there's a natural, uh, national case where we generate our energy on a national scale and also consume it on a national scale. So there's a lot more transport, and then you already see that hydrogen becomes a lot more important. And then there's the international scenario, which is most similar to what we do now, and that's import most of the energy. Then you see that also hydrogen will play a pretty significant role, almost a quarter of the energy. So what's already happening now? What, what are the projects that are going on? Sorry this is in Dutch, but uh, I thought this was a really interesting article. So this is actually uh, a project where they're reusing the drilling platforms that were used to uh, drill natural gas in the North Sea. And they're collecting all of the energy from uh, neighboring wind farms. They have a large electro electrolyzer on the platform and then they can both store the hydrogen underground in this gas bubble or they can use the existing pipeline to transport it to the coast. So already a really nice example of actually reusing old infrastructure in a new way. Then another nice one, even the, the oil giants of Dubai, they're looking into hydrogen. So here you can see a nice project where they're uh, building a large solar farm and then again using it for electrolysis to create hydrogen to power their vehicles. And also a very interesting one, it's still a little bit in the, how do you say, the laboratory stage, the experimental stage, uh, but this is actually creating hydrogen directly from sunlight. So these uh, students from or these researchers from a university in Belgium, they created these solar panels where they uh, put water vapor in there and then the, uh, the sunlight direct, directly splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen and then they can use the hydrogen, store it, transport it just like you would. So, and this actually already has an efficiency of 15% which again doesn't sound like a lot maybe but it actually is because um, yeah, the, the highest end solar panels, they have an efficiency of 30 to 40 percent and then the, the electrolyzer has another 50 percent. So then you already become between 15 and 20 percent. So actually this is also a very, very promising result. So that was it uh, for me. Thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to ask questions. <laughs>